It's our um, Half Moon One Pra Friday night here at Abide Geary. The uh, return, there she is, <laughs> return of the native, the return of the native. Beth is back with us for a while. Nice to see you, Beth, hiding behind Dennis. Many of the discussions that have been coming up uh, with people, the uh, past tea times and individual conversations, uh, the past few weeks or so, uh, keep rev revolving around uh, the theme of uh, obstinate mind states, uh, kind of the uh, relentless recurrence of uh, patterns of uh, perception, patterns of response that we all find ourselves wrapped up in uh, day after day. Basically, dukkha. <laughs> uh, and you know, there's a, you know many forms of dukkha, but uh, one of the persistent uh, manifestations is this. Uh, kind of this unwieldy mind, or it feels like sometimes that it's this unwieldy mind that just gets uh, stuck in patterns that uh, have evolved for who knows what reasons over years, lifetimes of, of conditioning. And sometimes it feels uh, daunting, frustrating, difficult, uh, and we kind of wonder, you know, should we adjust? Should we do something different? Should we uh, recalibrate? Uh, should we keep doing the same, persistent, be persistent, be constant, continue in the same path, just be patient? And uh, just find it uh, sometimes difficult to navigate. I think we're all familiar with that in many different ways. <clears throat> and this is, this is dukkha, this is the truth of dukkha, uh, that the conditioning that we all find ourselves in is, is, um, is strong. And it's so important to just keep stepping back and gaining perspective on uh, how we want to handle it, how we want to deal with it, how we want to respond to it. It's easy to get wrapped up in uh, a sense of, uh, oh, well, you know, it's just too hard. Um, let me see if I can find something else, some other approach uh, to, to life than uh, this process of self-examination and um, adjustment. And that's one response to dukkha. Uh, usually that, for the most part, that ends up in more dukkha. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that is one response to, to dukkha, is just falling into despair and uh, confusion. Another response, uh, the more skillful response, is to letting that sense of dis-ease just keep on invigorating us to, to keep looking for a way uh, to transcend that, to move from that. Because if we have some sense of faith in the Buddha's teachings at all, even just a, a little bit of faith in the teachings, uh, there is that uh, path that uh, he introduces uh, as a way uh, to, to see an end to it. And sometimes, you know, it is uh, crafted in many different uh, ways of, of thinking and talking about it. And, uh, some of the um, words that are used have a very, uh, sometimes a kind of a distant feeling to it or a, a unreachable kind of a feeling, you know, words like complete liberation and Nibbana uh, that uh, sometimes have a, a connotation of some uh, amazing, wonderful, almost near impossible state of mind that we enter into uh, and then everything is fine from 
thereon. More skillful, as Ajahn Sumedho often says, uh, to think of, of uh, the end of the path, the dukkha, uh, the, is, is the ending of dukkha. Um, you know, and if we think, if we know that we can uh, experience a little bit of letting go and a little bit of peace of mind through various approaches, um, then uh, we can hold in our awareness that there is a possibility for um, that to totally subside uh, and not to be involved. And it doesn't have to be couched in terms of, you know, attaining some sort of miraculous uh, uh, consciousness of some sort, uh, but more the, the gradual effacement uh, of all of that that leads us to uh, the repetitive patterns. It's just basically undoing, undoing patterns until there's, you know, not too much left to have to undo. So keeping that, keeping a, that perspective straightforward in our minds and not, not getting too lofty and, and putting things out of reach. And so much of the path is really uh, very simple in terms of uh, the fact that uh, the path is just a series of uh, recollections and reflections and considerations and uh, adopting certain uh, behaviors that work towards uh, abandoning uh, unwholesome states and uh, developing wholesome states of mind. So developing the kusala citta, the, the wholesome heart, the wholesome mind, and uh, unraveling, uh, deconstructing the akusala citta with its akusala dhammas, the, the unskillful uh, heart with its unskillful manifestations coming up. And it's just a gradual process of doing this uh, over uh, time. Uh, developing as best we can a, a strong sense of of mindfulness and, and comprehension, clear comprehension, so that uh, we can see these states of mind, skillful and unskillful, unskillful, as they arise, uh, and learning to catch them sooner and work with the tools that the Buddha gives us to help transform them. One of the interesting. Um, one of the interesting kind of uh, points that one can get a little bit from some of the uh, Buddhist psychology teachings, the, the Abhidhamma, is, is about uh, the fact that uh, any moment of, of awareness, of consciousness, uh, the, you can't have both kusala citta and akusala citta ha- occurring at the same time. You can't have a, a, a state of... Um, uh, unskillfulness uh, and a state of skillfulness in operation uh, conjointly. So, you know, essentially, uh, we all have moments of, of both. Most of us don't dwell in one of those um, kind of states of mind uh, for uh, forever, for, for very long. Uh, there's this constant tag team between wholesome and unwholesome states of mind uh, going back and forth. And basically the, the goal is to just very gradually over time, over years, uh, uh, start to uh, spend more time in, in the kusala citta and less time in the akusala citta. Uh, and uh, it's oftentimes just a... a a, a series of many, many, many moments of realization of when the mind moves into akusala citta and to recognize it and say, nope, don't want to be there. I mean, we, if we just had our practice oriented around all day, you know, just trying to be mindful and notice kusala citta or akusala citta, is this wholesome state of mind or is this an unwholesome state of mind? Uh, and 
dropping the unwholesome and turning to the wholesome uh, over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, that's, that's a path of practice. The ways that we develop uh, uh, kusala citta uh, are varied and numerous. Uh, the Buddha has a lot of different techniques um, and angles uh, to come from to abandon both the akusala and develop the kusala. But always, always turning back to the root foundation, the fundamentals of uh, speech and action starting there. Uh, and working our way back into the mind. One of the, uh, I think, a, a great example that's a, it's a very useful approach, uh, just from one angle uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path, is, is around right speech, just as a way of illustrating uh, this process. Uh, uh, there's a, a small group of folks here in the monastery that have been exploring. Uh, Nonviolent communication, uh, NVC, and most of you are probably familiar with uh, that to some extent. And it, it's a, a, a very skillful way of uh, producing harmony and clear communication, uh, clarity uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, it's really supportive of uh, life in a community uh, and contributes towards. Um, Mutual understanding, uh, in a way that uh, is is very useful. Sometimes it's not so much acknowledged, though, that it also has an effect, uh, a very strong effect, uh, in the heart of each individual who's who's working with that. Whether it's NVC technique or whether it's the principles of right speech in general, um, not only is it uh, conducive on the external level for. Uh, harmony and mutual understanding, but it turns back on itself. Because whenever we, and, and this works with any of the, the, the basic precepts, whether it's around speech or right action, right livelihood, those kinds of things, it, it turns back into the, into the heart, into the mind. Because, say, with, with speech, you know, if we practice uh, just by repetition and learning uh, new ways to say things, uh, that are uh, more clear uh, and uh, true to what it is we're trying to communicate uh, and acknowledging, acknowledging um, that there's um, skillful ways and unskillful ways to use speech, to use words that can either produce great good or great harm. Then as we just practice these uh, techniques of talking, uh, learning the words, learning the vocabulary, uh, uh, learning some kinds of structures uh, in speech, then it can't help but affect what is going on in the thinking mind. Because thoughts are the precursor to speech. That's the thought formation uh, is the thinking process. So as we reconstruct uh, the outward expression, um, then it starts to affect very strongly uh, the actual formative process in, in the mind, in the thinking mind, so that our thoughts will start to gradually turn more towards uh, skillful thoughts. And then those thoughts, uh, skillful thoughts, are also based on something deeper in the heart, deeper in the mind. They're based on feelings and perceptions, uh, inclinations, uh, that are bubbling up to um, lay the foundation for the particular thoughts that are forming. And so it then goes deeper. Uh, and if we're uh, finding our thoughts starting to adjust uh, to more skillful uh, forms, uh, little bits at a time, then we're becoming much more aware of the underlying uh, strata of, of the heart, uh, the it's called the citta sankara, the uh, feelings and perceptions that are um, informing uh, the formations that are coming out. So we start from the outside, work our way in, uh, do that along many different kinds of um, 
uh, of lines of uh, how uh, we manifest in the world, whether it's through uh, body or speech. And eventually we turn that in deeper to the structures, the the patterns in the mind themselves uh, in that same process. So working from the outside in is one of our strategies towards gradually developing the the kusala citta. And hopefully at some point we start to tip the balance and and the, the wholesome qualities start to supplant, take over uh, more of the space in the mind uh, a little bit at a time as the uh, unwholesome ones start to wear away and diminish through uh, non-reinforcement. Very gradual process and requires the development of another kusala dhamma, that of patience, and a long-term approach. You know, it's, it's um, you know, when you think about it uh, uh, and realize the, uh, the profundity of it, it it's, it's very useful um, in terms of, of, of how to let go of that sense of uh, impatience or urgency or uh, agitation uh, of, of uh, wanting results quicker than they can naturally appear. And, you know, gives us that perspective of, well, what else is there to do? You know, have I suf- haven't I suffered enough? There's a, a real nice uh, simile uh, that the Buddha uses uh, to kind of describe the practice of uh, this gradual mind transformation uh, from... Akusala Takusala. He uses a simile of uh, a goldsmith refining gold. And that the, the goldsmith starts out with uh, some uh, chunk of earth that uh, is known to, uh, to have gold in it. Or maybe uh, he's able to see the, uh, the, the colors of yellow in the, in the soil and recognizes, oh, there's something valuable here and uh, gets, gets his uh, samples of uh, earth uh, that, that contain the, the gold ore and uh, takes it into the refining process, starting with all the coarse chunks and, and stones that are um, in there, uh, slowly removing those until uh, they're, they're cleaned out. The next step being uh, using, say, something like a sieve to uh, use with water, washing the, the remains, washing out the, the coarse dirt and the coarse sand that's, that's remaining, mm-hmm. and being left with uh, still uh, a mixture of the, the, the gold dust and uh, some fine sand, uh, fine uh, grit, uh, that's still in there, washing it again, putting it through a finer sieve to to filter it out. And then uh, being left with, uh, finally, what is more apparent, becoming uh, the gold itself, uh, but still with uh, this very, very fine uh, black dirt uh, that's so fine it can't be filtered out. And the goldsmith puts it into a crucible, heats it up, uh, and uh, mixes it around, uh, presses it, uh, kneads it uh, until the heat is starting to warm up and and that black dust starts to burn off. It's called dross, burning off the dross. And then finally what's left is this uh, just pure gold. It's, it's uh, It's not contaminated anymore by by these uh, contaminants. And then it's still, though, uh, it's hard, it's brittle, it doesn't work very well, and he continues that process of of warming it up and uh, kneading it and uh, stirring it around until it becomes uh, malleable, uh, until it becomes workable. And then at that point, the the goldsmith is able to uh, 
mold it into anything that uh, he, he wants to, into ornaments and jewelry, uh, is able to to shape it and, and craft it into something uh, very beautiful. And the Buddha likens that process to uh, how we uh, deal with the, the obstructions in the mind so that the, uh, the, the stones and the, the coarse uh, chunks of, of earth are synonymous with the very coarse states of mind that we can all experience. Uh, the kinds of states of mind that are uh, strongly responding to the basic factors of, of greed, hatred, and delusion so that we do unskillful things uh, in our attempt to find temporary bits of happiness. Uh, we break precepts. Uh, we're uh, not considerate of life uh, or um, uh, other people. Uh, we involve ourselves in lying and stealing and taking advantage of others. And the removal of those uh, through precepts uh, uh, so that at least our uh, outward behavior, or our action, is, is cleansed, just like removing those chunks of earth and the, and the stones uh, in, the, in the gold mixture. Once we've kind of established that base of purity in the mind and start to uh, realize the effects of uh, following the, the precepts and, and not causing harm in that way, uh, there are still other obstructions in the mind. Uh, the next level associated with uh, the more um, uh, coarse sand, coarse dirt that, that's left uh, as being still having the presence of, of thoughts that are unskillful, even if the actions are uh, more skillful. Uh, the thoughts of uh, uh, sensual desire, of uh, ill will, of <clears throat> harming, cruelty, uh, can still be rolling around in our, in our minds, in our hearts. Those thoughts arise, um, even with restrained behavior. And so as we start to recognize that and cleanse ourselves of, of those states of mind through the various reflections uh, that the Buddha talks, looking at the disadvantages of these states of mind, uh, working with sense restraint uh, to quell the, uh, the craving that comes up, um, uh, investigating the, uh, the effects of ill will and of, of harmfulness uh, and seeing how it affects our heart and working towards developing uh, <clears throat> their opposites, uh, spaciousness, kindness, simplicity. Uh, that's akin to uh, washing and removing that coarse dirt, that coarse sand that's uh, clogging us up. <clears throat> And then, even with that, uh, and, and this is making great progress, actually, at that, at that level, if we're able to start uh, lessening those uh, states of mind. Uh, but uh, then sometimes uh, more refined uh, obstructions start to manifest. Thoughts of, in the Buddha's words, thoughts of family, thoughts of uh, the home, uh, particularly if one's a renunciate, uh, turning back thoughts of the lay life, maybe it's better that way. Um, and <clears throat> thoughts of dear ones, uh, people that uh, we've had relationships with, that kind of thing, Soci society, the world, um, family. Not necessarily unwholesome things, but um, still uh, with the simile being of uh, more fine sand, find grit, uh, that at least in the cleansing of the mind, uh, we want to, to cleanse the mind of that as well, so that our mind isn't uh, just dwelling uh, with those kinds of thoughts, even if they're not uh, grossly unwholesome in any way. <clears throat> one of the ways to help kind of reflect on that, uh, uh, even if one is involved in uh, the world, uh, not in a renunciate lifestyle, uh, is to just lessen the attachment uh, to those, even those skillful states that we might find ourselves involved with through the reflection on impermanence, uh, realizing that uh, even skillful uh, relations, skillful uh, ways of being in the world, skillful livelihood, 
that uh, uh, th there is an end to that, that everything is subject to change. Um, we grow, we grow up, we, you know, our families uh, grow up, uh, situations change, uh, we have difficulties that we have to deal with in, in the world, even though our intentions are, are uh, skillful and, and clean, not everybody else's are, so we have to deal with problems uh, that come in uh, based on other people's unskillful actions. Uh, but just stepping back, reflecting on the transience of all of this, and, and in that way that uh, we know that everything changes, we become less bound by uh, these circumstances. We still f find ourselves in them uh, and with them, but we're not uh, bound by them. Uh, we can find a way to, to be present uh, without moving into to dukkha, without moving into suffering. So gradually uh, filtering out um, that fine sand, fine uh, dirt that's uh, uh, obstruct, obstructing or causing us difficulties. Then once that's done, we're left with this uh, gold dust that's uh, mixed with a little bit of fine, fine, very, very, very fine dust, dirt um, that still is... Um, still is there. And the Buddha actually likens that to, uh, once we've abandoned these other more worldly thoughts uh, and concerns, uh, we, we pick up reflections on Dhamma. Uh, very skillful, very wholesome uh, things to, to bring into our minds for reflection, the thoughts around practicing Dhamma, what does it, how does it all fit in, uh, to right view, and uh, what are some of the reflections that we can take up in our practice to help settle the mind, purify the mind, what objects do we want to, to, to take up uh, for, for recollection, for consideration. And this is the equivalent of starting to burn off the dross uh, so that we can even at some point turn away from the active processes of recollecting and thinking about uh, Dhamma to uh, letting that do its work uh, and uh, slowly settle uh, to where there isn't even uh, a concern about having to generate uh, thoughts of uh, along the lines of Dhamma. And then we're just left with a pure stillness quality of mind um, that uh, is uh, free from uh, any kind of... Uh, uh, activity uh, that might be obstructing its its pure, bright, innate quality. Still, it may not be quite workable yet. There's still some subtle uh, ways that the mind is holding on, just as like the, the, the gold is not quite, um, is still a little bit brittle, not quite malleable. So we just continue that process of finding the right balance between uh, heat and cool, the right temperature for the gold to become malleable, uh, how we adjust our uh, energy uh, and uh, putting forth effort in a uh, uh, determined way, but letting go and relaxing, finding that balance between energy and relaxation until we find that perfect balance of mind that's very malleable and uh, ready for uh, insight, letting go. So this is the, the simile the Buddha uses to uh, development of the heart, development of the mind, uh, refining of, of the citta, uh, gradually casting away the unwholesome, supplanting it with the wholesome. And the basic tool is repetition, uh, just doing it over and over and over again until we don't have to anymore. Yeah. 
And it doesn't mean that certain uh, tendencies and patterns don't return. Uh, you know, this is a, it's not a completely linear process. We um, have periods where we can get quite uh, refined and pure and then the underlying tendencies, uh, if the, you know, until they're completely eradicated through this repeti- repetition, uh, will come back again. Uh, and we find ourselves back at uh, the stage of sometimes even all the way back to the stages of, you know, coarse chunks of, of dirt and stones. And, and if that's where we find ourselves returning to, that's where we pick up again and start with that process. Hopefully being able to move on uh, a little bit more quickly uh, as time goes on and we gain more experience. Or we return to one of the other uh, phases of mental development uh, uh, through, the, through the underlying tendencies coming resurging. So it's not a completely linear uh, process, but uh, there's some, some back and forth that, that goes along with that. And then even then, uh, certain patterns, we, you know, the, really finally learning the appropriate response to the ending of dukkha, the, certain patterns will still arise, um, but they don't lead us into that kind of despair or dukkha or confusion. There's a, a, a simile that uh, has been coming up uh, also recently that attributed both to, to Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Dun, um, where a, a person is asking them, you know, uh, Lung Pa, do you still have uh, anger? Do you still experience anger? And a quote that's attributed to both of those masters is, yes, but I don't pick it up. Which is really quite profound and reassuring at the same time because it, it, it acknowledges that certain patterns of perception uh, can still arise even in the mind of somebody who's completely liberated, but they, what, it's just like any kind of sensory experience through any of the other sense doors. You know, we still experience sights and sounds and tastes and smells and tactile sensations. And we also experience um, certain patterns of, of uh, unpleasant mental states that, that will arise. But they are not ever picked up. They're, they're, they are seen... Um, right in that moment, as they are arising, uh, as they are persisting, and as they are passing on, uh, without any form of uh, uh, attachment, picking up, uh, moving with it, moving into it, uh, being confused by it. And uh, they're just merely patterns, they're merely perceptions, just as a visual perception or the perception of um, bodily sensation uh, arises, persists, passes away in its own time without any form of uh, attachment, without any form of clinging, uh, arising, without any form of craving, coming to compound it. So these things will still arise, uh, but they're known for what they are, uh, just as they are, uh, and known as they pass away. So this is the gradual training, uh, the gradual refinement of the mind, gradual refinement of the heart, just like refining gold. And as, I, as I've said a couple of times already, it's uh, one of the best virtues that we can employ for the whole process is, is patience, kanti, uh, the supreme crucible, as you will, uh, the supreme crucible for the ending of uh, all the obstructions. And also, just in the process, not to let any of the difficulties weigh us down and make us heavy, uh, because really it is a gradual lightening of the burden uh, that, that we all experience. And and there really is, uh, even if we just look at the little successes, the getting rid of a few big stones every now and then, uh, and take uh, heart uh, in, in that. Uh, not, not measuring ourselves against the final goal, but measuring ourselves about where we have come, even if it's just a small step. Uh, and to take delight in that. Uh, so important to keep that perspective. 
uh, that each of us has a different trajectory. You know, we don't know how fast uh, we will be able to uh, abandon the unskillful, unwholesome states and, and develop the skillful ones. But um, we take uh, refuge uh, in the fact that little bits at a time is possible and uh, take heart at uh, what we have been able to, to understand and realize. And to just, um, yeah, enjoy that, uh, live lightly with that, reflect on that, bring that to mind. That's substituting a, an unskillful state of mind that it can grow into despond uh, or confusion and substituting it with a, well, here, this is where I'm at. This is what I've uh, been able to let go of. This is what I, these are the moments of kindness and uh, a uh, little bit of contentment and a uh, little bit of humor. Humor is always an important part of the, the process. Uh, and to just let it just simplify our whole lives, our whole outlook, and so that we can walk around, open our eyes, look around us, enjoy the idiosyncrasies of all of the people that we're living with or having to encounter, uh, realizing that at least here, uh, in this space, uh, we are all coming together for the same reason. You know, we're, we're all in many different places, but at least we have this common wish um, to uh, be happier and to help others be happier and to um, develop uh, wholesome, skillful states of mind uh, and let go of the more obstructive ones. And this is what we're all here doing. And uh, we all have our flavors uh, that manifest uh, different colors. And we're all different creatures with different uh, different regalia that we present to the world. But um, our hearts are all in the same place. And so to reflect on that, too, uh, and uh, move about as kindly as we can and as sensitively as we can and uh, as, uh, 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 yeah, just with a sense of, of, of kindness and gentleness and, and care uh, for ourselves and for those around us. So I'll leave it there for the reflection this evening. <laughs>